Hey Big Geeks and welcome back to another beer stash raid during COVID-19 fun times. Uh, this week I was going to do a video all about this beauty here. So this is Character Rouge uh, from Roddenbach, so a fruited Flemish red. And then about two days ago a little alert flashed up on my phone. And it was a calendar alert. And I'm not the most organised guy, so that rarely happens at the best of times. But on it, it said, drink your gurs. And so I thought for a second, I was like, what on earth does that mean? And then I realised it must mean this. Now this is gurs on film, a hilariously named uh, traditional gurs, which I in fact blended myself during Tour de Gurs 2017 at Lindemann's brewery. So we're on Tour de Gers, which is a, a weekend where all of the Lambic producers and Lambic blenders of the Bajotten region just outside of Brussels in Belgium open up their breweries and you can go there and drink all of their beers, some like fresh Lambic from the casks, lots of their Gerses, fruited beers, and they tend to release special beers as well. All of them kind of compete to try and put on an awesome show. Um, and Lindemann's went all out that year. Not only did they have, I'm pretty sure there was dry ice and music in the barrel rooms, but they also had the opportunity for people with enough of the tokens left to blend their own gurs at the end of the tour. And that's exactly what I did. So this is an absolute beer geek dream to be able to blend your own gurs. And there are a lot of excited people like me milling around. And I made a video of it, which I released a couple of weeks later. So. You might want to watch that video again just to get some context around the beer I'm about to drink, but also it's got a really good quick intro uh, into what a Gers is, how it's made, and then we can dive into the specifics of this uh, and really nerd out. So whether you watch the video or not, a quick summary would be that we were given four barrels, four different ages of Lambic, and we were able to blend as we wanted. The only rule was that you needed 200 ml of barrel one, so the sweetest, because you need enough sugar in that bottle to re-ferment and actually get carbonation, because uh, Gerses have to be bottle conditioned. You can't carbonate them before they put in to be a traditional Oud Aud Gers. Um, so after putting 200 ml in the bottle or deciding to, I then had to pick from three other barrels as to what kind of combination of flavors I wanted. Now in the video, for some reason, I completely disregard one barrel. I'm gonna leave the neutral lambic out. Like, what's it adding? What's it doing? Get out of here. Um, I'm sure there was some thinking behind it, but it was the neutral barrel. So it was the barrel that wasn't adding all that much flavor. Uh, which is probably a great big mistake because it must be there for a reason. And probably that reason is that there's still lots of exciting developments to happen and they rely on that in the bottle. That the It's not really sweet because lots of the uh, Saccharomyces has got to work and eat lots of the sugar, but the Brett hasn't got to work so it's not really funky. But the Brett would definitely get to work in the bottle. So I'm a little bit worried about how this is going to turn out. So I used a fair amount of young Lambic, thinking I'd get lots and lots of character from that, and a little bit of old Lambic to make sure that I did get some age character. At that point, uh, Mike Murphy from Leerwig Brewery wanders into shot, and I ask him to give my, um, my trial blend a quick sip, and he says, well, it's a little bit sweet, Johnny. Give it three Seal of years. Approval. Give it three years. Wait three years before drinking it. So that must have been why I put into my phone that today I should drink it, because it's three years since I shot that video. And now we're gonna see whether Mike's advice was correct. So without further ado, I'm gonna crack this. Another thing that really scared me during that video is the way that I added the beer. I think most people or anybody sensible would have used the funnel that's in that video and poured it gently and slowly at an angle to reduce oxidation. I just like, just like, I mean, like a ketchup bottle pretty much into the funnel. So I'm hoping uh, it hasn't got horrendously oxidized. Um, and I'm also hoping that my corking was good because that also took a little while as you'll see in the video. So this is probably a moment I'm only going to experience once in my life. And there's only one of these bottles in the world, which makes this the rarest beer in my stash. So I'm just going to, just going to enjoy this moment a little bit. Pray the cork doesn't break as well. So first test, does it pop? Ah, oh my god, and I can smell it. Smells like white wine. Oaky, oh my god, this might have worked. So next big test, carbonation and colour. Hopefully a nice 
a nice light mahogany colour to show not too much oxidation. Oh, it's a good colour. It's a good colour and there's loads of carb. That, my friends, is better than I ever dreamed that could be. I thought I'd messed this up. I assumed it was just a gimmick in the brewery, to be honest. Um, I thought that all of these beers would be coming out oxidised. Maybe they wouldn't carb. Um, I can smell it from here. Really cidery, really funky, scrumpy cider, like that really gnarly stuff you get in those horrible jars in cheap tourist places uh, in Devon and Somerset. Little hints of caramel, so oxidation that's been happening over three years. And a really um, savoury note, like really unripe rhubarb, kind of vegetal verging on sweet aroma. And some classic lemony acidity from, from the Lactobacillus, the Pediococcus. Uh, it's got a lovely, like, I can't get that head to dissipate, which is really rare in a sour beer. Uh, usually the sourness destroys the head, but it's looking real healthy. I'm very happy with that. Big sourness. Big, big, bold breathiness. Really dry and appley. Um, reminds me a little bit of the Dree Fontaine and Gers in that it's it's really dry and cidery. There's a little bit of acetic, lending a little bit from Hansen's there. Maybe just a shade too much acetic acid, so just a little bit too vinegary to be perfectly balanced, but not at all off-putting. I mean, come on, that's fucking excellent. I mean, it's not perfectly balanced, but it's got a lovely sherbetiness. I'd want a little bit more freshness, a little bit more zip, a little bit more lemon, a tiny bit less vinegar. But if you'd given that to me and said, this is a professionally made, traditional uh, gers, I'd have been like, yeah. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good gers. It's not a brilliant gers, it's a good gers. Maybe it's a little bit overage, maybe it's a little bit oxidized, but it's well made. Um, now, obviously, I can take almost zero credit for that. That's all down to Lindemans. I know the Lindemans get a lot of stick because they do make a lot of the, the, the heavily fruited, well, fr heavily fruit syruped and, and sweeter, uh, sweetened beers. Um, and they had to do that to survive back when Lambic was the least trendy beer on the planet. In fact, nobody really knew it existed apart from the people of Brussels, and the people of Brussels didn't really like it. Um, so they get a lot of stick, but actually Cuvée René is one of my favourite Gerses. Um, I'd rather drink it over Cantillon Gers. I mean, Cuvée René Creek is also really lovely, really rich cherry. It's not the best uh, Oud Creek out there, but it is great. Um, and they make fantastic, fantastic Lambic, like the, just the straight stuff out of the barrel from their wort. Um, so good that, you know, Teal can use it. Um, uh, I mean, lots of different blenders use it. Um, because it is quality, quality lambic. It's just the sweetening side that people didn't enjoy. Um, so of course they're going to produce wonderful lambic and of course they give good lambic to the public during Tour de Guerre. So that's all on them. The reason I'm blowing my own trumpet is because I thought I'd made a massive mess up um, just by completely getting rid of the neutral gears. And maybe that's why it's not perfectly balanced. Uh, maybe why that's why there's a little bit more acetic in there because that really aged stuff really, really went uh, acetic. So it's not perfect and I wish I put a little bit of neutral in, but that is, that is good. I am gonna drink the entire bottle of that and I half expected to be pouring it down the drain having gone, oh, well, that was, that was fun at the time and an interesting experiment. Um, so I guess I have to say huge thanks to Lindemans, huge thanks to Mike Murphy who told me to wait three years, huge thanks to, uh, to historic self for putting that reminder in the diary, and huge, huge thanks to Tom of Beerfart who held the camera while I failed to put the cork in. Um, I'm going to sit back, enjoy that. I've got some cheese on my cheese tasting show last week that I was going to be wonderful with that, some funky cheese. Um, and I'm going to have a whale of a time and just enjoy the moment where I blended my own gears and it was 100% tolerable.
So that was the rarest beer in my beer stash. I would love you guys to keep cracking your beers. We're still getting a couple of tweets a week of people uh, who are raiding their beer stashes, cracking some stuff that they were saving for a special occasion and have decided to drink it before the world ends. Uh, and you can tag us in using the hashtag beer stash and we will respond and we will read it out in our Friday 5pm podcasts where we can. Now, quick note, if you're watching this on Dave, it's irrelevant, but this Saturday we are doing another live show in which we'll be drinking Lindemann's Cuvée René uh, in a drink along and with a pub quiz. So join us on Saturday night if it is indeed still the, uh, the uh, May 2020. I've forgotten what month it is now. I struggle with the days and now it's months. Cheers, guys. <laughs>